So good to have all of you with us this uh, Canada Day long weekend uh, as we're starting a new sermon series called, on the screen, Summer Soundtrack. Um, I love music. Anybody out there? You, you love music? Yeah, it's kind of weird if you don't. Um, you know, w- one of the things I love about music is that it's universal, right? Like you can go any culture, any time, any place. There have always been people um, recording music or writing music, uh, you know, coming up with music, singing music. It's, it's just, it's, it's all over, right? And it's, and it's always been all over. And one of the things that I love about music is that you can listen to a song or like an album and it brings you back to a certain time and place. Anyone ever have this, right? Like, I remember the songs I was listening to when my daughter Nora was being born. Like, anyone? Butterfly Kisses? Yeah? That song is cruel. That song was written to make grown men cry. <laughs> right? But I remember, right? Like, I remember the songs I was listening to when my dad passed away 15 years ago. I remember the songs... I was listening to when I became the lead pastor of this church, which I just realized was five years ago this Sunday. Uh, Just time is like flying by. Yeah. But but I remember these these songs, and you listen to these songs. Now, granted, those three scenarios, from the birth of my daughter, the death of my dad, or becoming the pastor, right? They were different songs. There's different soundtracks that I was listening to, and and that music kind of helped me process the season I was in. Right, because this is what good music does, right? It, it kind of helps us make sense of the seasons, these, these soundtracks. And did you know that Jesus had soundtracks? Uh, it, it, it's actually very, very true. Jesus had 150 different songs, uh, poems, and prayers that he would have had memorized. 150. Uh, we, we, we call these soundtracks the Psalms. And, and really what I want to do for the next little bit is we're going to kind of anchor down in, in some of the Psalms that, that, that are going to kind of show us the, the, the different music for the different seasons of life. Because th- this is what Jesus did. Like, like for real, not only did Jesus memorize all 150 of the Psalms, um, in the New Testament, he actually quotes the Old Testament. Out of all of the quotes in the Old Testament, about half of them come from these soundtracks. Like, just try to like wrap your head around that. Around 50% of every Old Testament quote Jesus makes comes from the Psalms. He, he listened to his soundtracks a lot. And so this is what we're going to be doing. Over the next uh, journey together, we're going to be going into the Psalms, looking at, at different Psalms, some of the, the different soundtracks for the different seasons of life. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, the soundtrack that's called the Psalms of Praise. Let me hear you say praise. 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 There are many, many Psalms that would be categorized as Psalms of Praise, but today I, I'm just going to use one as like a case study. We're going to go to Psalm 103. So if you have a Bible, Turn with me to Psalm 103. Uh, This psalm was written by King David. Same guy that we just finished a sermon series on two weeks ago. Remember that Dave series? That guy wrote this psalm that we're about to be in. And and I honestly just believe this morning that as we read these words, that really we're going to be blessed kind of on two different fronts. Number one, that, that God is going to speak his words into our lives, but the beauty of the Psalms is that it actually gives us words to speak back to God. And so we're going to see both of that kind of in this today. But here it is, Psalm 103, verse 1. David starts by saying this, Praise the Lord my soul, in all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord my soul, and forget not his benefits. All right, so as we start this psalm, we're kind of walking into this little therapy session with, with David. He's, he, he starts by doing some kind of constructive self-talk, right? He's, praise the Lord, my soul. All that is within me, praise his holy name. He's talking to himself. Anybody here do this? Like, I don't know if I should raise my hand right now. 
You know, I was thinking over my life. Th- there's one area that I know I do this when I'm golfing. I do. I do. I love golf. Like it is seriously one of my favorite things to do. Here's the problem. I'm not good. <laughs> like at all. So inevitably what will happen, and I've been working on this for years, but I'll get, stand up on the tee block and I go up and I hit the ball and I do something wrong and my ball goes in that direction. Like, it should go in that direction, but it goes in that direction. And every single time that I lose my ball and I slice it into the woods, there's this part of me that I start to talk to myself. I'm like, come on, Danny. It's like, get your head in the game, Danny. You're better than this, right? Like, and honestly, probably any golfer or, or, or athlete, just we'll open this up to any sport, will understand what I'm talking about, right? There are moments that, that it's just like you have to pick yourself up by the scruff of your neck in order to move forward. Well, this is exactly what David's doing here, except here, he's not concerned that his golf game was off. He's concerned that his God game was off, right? There, it, it was like he, he had the ability to look inside at his soul, and he's concerned because his soul was not praising God enough. And so he starts writing these words, talking to himself, saying, wake up, soul. You got to pay attention. You got to get your head into the game, soul, and praise the Lord. And and, and then he says these words. I, I love it. He says, and also, and forget not his benefits. Because David knows. All right, so see the picture. He's trying to coax himself into worship. He's inspiring himself. So, so, so how does David do this? In order to get praise, he goes to the benefits. Oh, come on, Parkwood. Anybody know that there are benefits to being a child of God? There, there, there are. Um, in fact, let, we're, we're going to read Psalms uh, 2 uh, through 5 r- r- right here. It just says this. So praise the Lord, my soul. Forget not his benefits. And then here's like the benefits package, Right? He says, who forgives all our sins, heals all our diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. That's not a bad benefits package. When I was in Bible college, uh, I worked at the keg, uh, steakhouse and bar. I, w- I was a cook at the keg for five years. And it's pretty much how I kind of paid my way through, through, through college. And when I worked uh, there, it was, it was a pretty sweet deal, right? Like I, we actually had 40% off your meal. Like if you were actually going to buy a meal, it was 40% off. So it only cost like $200 a plate, <laughs> you know? <laughs> It was awesome. It, you know, even if you didn't want to pay for a meal, it was like all the starches. So you got like French fries, potatoes, like your vegetables, rice. All that was free, free pop, like, like water, like tea, coffee, all that stuff. Was, and even as a cook, we got tipped out at the end of the night, uh, which, which wasn't bad, right? Like these were the benefits of the keg. Now my guess is for those of us that are in like uh, salary positions in, in different employers, you have a benefits package, Right? I, I was actually Googling uh, today about Google and their benefits package. And, 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 I, and I was looking at things like Amazon. And, and you got all these big companies, right, that just have ridiculous benefits packages, right, that they offer. Here's what I'm going to argue. That what we just read right here, this benefits package of God is infinitely better than anything Google or Amazon could ever come up with. Like like this, what we're being offered here is is absolutely amazing in the same way that when you come under the umbrella of an employer, there's benefits. When we come under the umbrella of God, there are benefits to being his children. And so what I want to do is I just want to, what we just read there, I I want to kind of take a little bit more time and kind of show you bit by bit what the benefits are because I believe, like David believed, that the more we do this, that the more that we understand the benefits package, that the more that we rest in the benefits package, the more that our souls will praise the Lord. All right, you ready to go with me? 
You want to look at the benefits? All right. Here's the first benefit listed. God forgives all our sins. All of, yeah, come on. <laughs> that was good. One person was happy. God forgives all our sins, all of them. When Jesus died on the cross, he died for all of our sins, past, present, and future. He died for the sins that we know we need to be forgiven of, and he also died for the sins that we don't even know we've committed. He died for all of them. Like, listen, I, I don't stand up here a perfect man at all, but I do stand up here a man covered in the perfect blood of the perfect son, Jesus Christ. Praise God, he forgives all our sins, all of them, and, and then get this, because he's going to go on in verse 10 through 12 of this psalm uh, to just kind of spread this out a little bit more. He says this about God. He says, he does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquity. Okay, if there's ever a Bible verse that you want to memorize, it's that. God does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. See the picture. When you come under the umbrella of God, not only does he forgive all of our sins, but he removes them from his presence. Gone. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he has removed our transgressions. Let, let, let me try to explain this. You, you ever get in an argument with somebody? You're like, no, I've never argued with anybody. Yeah, okay. Yeah, ha, have you ever been in an argument with somebody and it's just not going well? And then about halfway through the argument, uh, they just kind of bring up something from like a year ago or five years ago that has nothing to do with what you're talking about? You're like, man, how long have you been holding on to that? You know? Hey, God doesn't do that. Okay? When we sin, he doesn't, like, put that in his back pocket to bring out for a rainy day. And like, well, what about summer of 99? You know, like, he doesn't do that. He forgives us of all of our sins, and then he removes them. They're gone. And this is the first benefit of being a child of God. And this benefit, this first benefit is so great in and of itself that it would have been appropriate for David to say, praise the Lord my soul and forget not this one benefit. He forgives our sins. But that's not what David said. He said, praise the Lord my soul, forget not all the benefits. There are many, many. So yes, number one, God forgives all our sins. Here's the second one. God heals all our diseases. All our diseases. And, and, and I know that even as I say that, there are people in the room that are thinking, no, no, he doesn't. I've been sick with cancer for years. I've I've struggled with my mental health for years. God may heal some diseases, but he doesn't heal all diseases. Friend, I just want to tell you, yes, he does. Yes, he, he does. And let, let, me, let me just try to explain for a moment. Uh, I've been pastoring uh, for 15 years in this church. Uh, I was actually hired on for almost five, four years, so about 19 years in total working at this church in ministry. And, and during that time, one of the things that we do as pastors is we pray for people when they're sick. You know, this is a good thing. And can I just be honest for a moment? I have prayed for people with as much faith as I could come up with, and they have died. Someone's thinking, I'm no longer going to him for prayer. <laughs> I'm no longer. You know, after church, just go see Pastor Gary and Jen. You know, they'll... They'll, they'll take care of you. <laughs> like, the truth is, man, like I have stood beside hospital beds with a lot of faith believing for that miracle and that person has died. I should also say I have stood beside hospital beds, breads, <laughs> beds, 
believing in faith with miracle, and I have watched miracles happen. Like, I, 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 I have seen um, sick people miraculously healed. Then begs the question, like, okay, well, like, why does God choose to do it this way, this time, and not this way, this time, and all this stuff? And, like, honestly, I'm, I'm not even going to attempt to answer that. What, what, what I do know is that our faith has something to do with it. I know that God's sovereignty has something to do with it. But what I want you to hear this morning is this, that God's heart posture towards his children is one of healing. Like God is a good father and what he wants, what he desires over his children is complete healing, body, mind, and spirit. And we will receive this healing one way or another. We will receive this healing in this life or in the one to come. Now listen, like I said, I've seen enough healings, uh, mere miraculous healings in my lifetime to know that we should Never stop praying in faith. We should always believe the best and, and just like trust that God can move in our circumstance. Absolutely. But also, I want to throw in the other thing that, that the Bible presents. It's not just this expectation in the here and now, but the promise of what's going to come in the life. Uh, that, what's going to come in, in the next life. Because listen, here's what the Bible teaches. This life is not it. It's not. Uh, In fact, the Bible goes out of its way to say that this life that we're in right now is like a blip on the radar. Like, in light of eternity, what we experience in the here and now, it is short. Very short. And in the life to come, 1 Corinthians 15, just it's an entire chapter basically on this. And it says that it basically in the same way that Jesus walked out of that tomb in a new resurrected body, so will we. And this body that we will have is imperishable, powerful. It doesn't get sick. It doesn't break down. It doesn't die out. I've said this here before, but... Parkwood, won't it be great when we won't have doctors anymore? Honestly, and I say that knowing that there's probably a few in the room. <laughs> so I don't mean this as a slam towards doctors. We, I love doctors, nurses, psychiatrists, psychotherapists, all these people who help us with our bodies and our minds. We love all of these people, but we long for the day when we don't need their services anymore. Right? We long for that day. This will be the case with the resurrected body. There's no meds in the cabinet. There's no wheelchairs. There's no crutches. None of that stuff. Why? How? Because of what David just said. God heals all our diseases. All of them. And so listen, if this is you right now, like if you're in the room and you are like just struggling with something, um, just a couple of thoughts. Number one, just... Hold on, like have hope, Uh, pray with faith today, believing for your miracle today. Talk to God, Lord, I know your posture towards me is one of healing. God, I believe that you want good things over my life right now. We, We believe in faith, absolutely, but we rest in absolute confidence that in the life to come, we will be healed one way or another. Like this is the good thing. So right here, God forgives all our sins. Number two, God heals all our diseases and it's still not done. Here's, here's the third one. God pulls us out of the pit. <laughs> the pit is where God found you. Like God didn't find you uh, standing on top of a skyscraper like Superman with your cape blowing in the wind. He found you stuck in a hole, deep in a hole, unable to set yourself free. I wonder, is there anybody here who remembers what life was like in the pit? Anybody here remember what life was like without Jesus? Yeah, man, it was awful. It's hopeless. This, this constant pursuit of trying to find fulfillment in all these different things, running for things to satisfy us the whole time, nothing ever could. It would numb us for a moment. And then we were hungry and thirsty again, right? Like, like this, this, is, 
This is life in the pit. And for some of you here today, you're saying, man, that's not like a past tense thing. That's where I'm at right now. I have, I have slid so deep down into that pit that I don't even know if God could find me. Friend, if that's you, just really quick, not only can God find you, but he is the only one with arms long enough and strong enough to pull you out. The only one. All, all it takes from you is to turn to him and say, God, I need you. God, I'm done doing it my own way. The, the, the pit is awful. The, 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 the pit sucks. Can I say that? <laughs> right? We're, like, we're just chasing after all these different things. God, I'm done. I need you. I need saving. And like that, he will pull you up out of that pit. He will, and then, actually, I love verse 4. It says that not only does God pull us out of the pit, but it says then he crowns us with love and compassion. <laughs> love and compassion. God doesn't pull us up out of the pit to then turn and say, wow, you really messed that one up. He doesn't pull us up out of the pit to immediately, you know, like scold us or shame us. No, remember, he's removed our sin. It's gone. He pulls us up out of the pit to, to cover us in his love and in his compassion. Why? Because this is, this is the forever fatherly heart towards his children. He pulls us up out of the pit to, to crown us, to cover us in his love and compassion. It makes me think of the story of the prodigal son. Luke 15, remember the, the lost son? takes his father's inheritance, and he wastes it on wild, reckless living. Like, wastes it. Every dollar, every cent gone. He literally finds himself in a pit with pigs. And he comes to his senses, I, I got to go home. It's better for me to be a slave in my father's house than, than to be here. And he's on his way back. And do you remember what happens when the father sees him? Yeah, here's what the father doesn't do. The father doesn't see his son and say, are you kidding me? You mean to tell me you lost everything? Do you know how hard I worked for that money and it's gone? That's not what the father does. What does he do? He runs to him, throws his arms around him, puts a robe on his back, ring on his finger, and sandals on his feet, and then throws a party. Why? Because when God pulls us out of the pit, he crowns us with love and compassion. This is part of the benefits package of God. Like anybody, anybody feeling this this morning, right? Like, like this is what it means to be under that umbrella of God. He forgives our sins. He heals our diseases. He, he pulls us up out of that pit. And then he crowns us with love and compassion. And then here's, here's the, the last one is this. It says that God, in verse 5, renews our youth. Hmm. Now this um, youth being renewed thing here is not speaking about our physical youth. It's not saying like there's like a fountain of youth out there and God's going to provide it and if you just drink from it, your beard's never going to go white. Um, that's, that's, that's not what this is talking about. It's not talking about our physical youth, it's talking about our spiritual youth. Think of the words of Jesus. And Jesus says that unless you have faith like one of these children, you cannot enter my kingdom. There is a spiritual youth that God demands of his followers. Demands. It's not a suggestion. <laughs> He demands it, right? This, this ability to like want to believe the best, hope for the best, have faith to believe that God actually can do what he said he's going to do. This is spiritual youth. Our problem is like G.K. Chesterton said, is that God is the one who stayed young and we're the ones who have gotten old. It just happens, man. We go through life, see things, experience things, and all of a sudden, we just kind of get crusty, right? We just kind of, we get cynical. 
skeptical. We find ourselves in places where, honestly, we're not even giving God a chance to intervene in our situation because we immediately write him off. The moment we get into a situation, we're like, well, I've seen this before, and it worked out this way, so I know what's coming. And, and you know what that is? That, that's, that's being spiritually old. That's, 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 that's getting crusty. That, that, that's, that's not the way that God wants us to live. What he comes to do is he comes to renew our spiritual youth to believe again. And you know, um, worship team, come, come on back up. When, when I think of this, When I think about what it looks like to be renewed with spiritual youth, I think about Pastor Gary and Jan Beasley. I do. I, I asked their permission if I could share this uh, this morning. Uh, they've shared it on the Parkwood prayer time that they run here. Uh, but Jan right now is battling cancer. Um, and I love the way that she says it. She's battling cancer. Uh, there's a physical battle. There is a spiritual battle here uh, every day. And, 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 and one of the unique things in, in this situation is that I've had kind of a front row seat uh, right from the very beginning uh, to when Jan was just experiencing some discomfort in her body, going through tests, and now the treatment plans and all this kind of stuff. And, and I, I don't really know how to explain it, but it's almost like every day that goes by, they're getting younger and younger and younger. There's, there, there, there's something that I've been able to watch that over a period of time you can't fake. <laughs> and as I watch them go through this and in this journey, it's like their spiritual youth is just being renewed day by day. They believe the best, they hope for the best, and they have faith. I mean real faith that has inspired me to believe that God is going to do a miracle. God is going to do a miracle. Yeah. And you know, like, like most times in the church when we share testimonies, we share the testimony like, after we kind of know what happened, right? So we stand up. You know, some of the most powerful testimonies are right when you're in the middle of it. Yeah. Right when you're in the middle of it. And to hold on to God like you never have before in your life and to say, listen, I trust in you, Jesus. I believe in you, Jesus. I'm hoping in you, Jesus. I have faith, Jesus, that you are gonna do what you said you're gonna do, that your posture right now is healing. You know what that is? That's, being, that, that's your spiritual youth being renewed day by day. The question is like, how do you get there? How do you, how do you get there? Well, if you look at verse five, it doesn't just say that he renews our youth. It, it actually says that he satisfies our desires with good things so that our youth is renewed. One of the things about Gary uh, and Jan Beasley, these amazing pastors, is that they are worshipers. They are prayer warriors. They seek the Lord and spend time in his presence so much so that the Lord satisfies their desires. And the more the Lord satisfies their desires, the more day by day their youth is being renewed. These are the benefits of God. He forgives our sins. He heals our diseases. He picks us up out of that pit where we were lost and then he crowns us with love and compassion. He satisfies our desires with good things so much so that our spiritual youth is renewed like the eagles. Can we stand on up? The question now is what do you do with a message like this? What do you do What's the appropriate response to the benefits package of God? <laughs> it's simple. We praise. We praise. Remember, this is all set in the context of David persuading himself into praising the Lord. Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul. Forget not his benefits. Why does he write this? 
Well, because oftentimes, whether we like to admit it or not, praise doesn't always come naturally. At times, we are experts in not praising God. David, who wrote like half, almost half of all of the Psalms, finds himself in a position of saying, I'm not there. I'm not where I should be, and I need to get back at it. So come on, soul. Wake up. So listen, if, like, if this is you today, if you're finding yourself in a position today where it's just like, ah, I'm not where I should be, you know what you need to start doing? You need to start talking to yourself. You, 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 need, you need, like, get your head in the game, <laughs> you know? Like, like this, is, this is for real. You need to remind yourself this morning, man, God has forgiven my sins. God is healing my diseases. God pulled me up out of that pit. He surrounds me with love and compassion. He satisfies my desires. He's, he's renewing my youth in this moment right now. Get your head into the game, soul, and praise the Lord. This is what we need to do. This is how we move forward. Through psalms of praise. Through psalms of praise. And listen, can I just tell you, man, when it comes to praise, mm, kind of got like, <laughs> it's a unique subject, right? Because we kind of come, especially with something like musical praise, worship. We, we're like, we, we know, but it's like we come with all these excuses. We're like, well, I'm not a good singer. Well, friend, God didn't ask. He just said, sing. He said, well, if I raised my hands, I would look weird. Well, okay, uh, God still says, raise your hands and worship. It's God who says, you need to kneel, you need to dance, you need to clap, you need to jump. Like, it gives us a whole, you say, well, worship's an inward posture thing. It's like, yeah, it is. First and foremost, absolutely, but the Bible gives us many physical postures to articulate the inward heart posture. You understand what I'm talking about? It's a choice. It's a choice. It's a choice. And so I don't know what God's doing in your heart today, but I know that inside of Danny Gray, there are moments just like David. And it's like, I am not praising the Lord like I should. And maybe that's because of a circumstance that comes in, life throws you the curveball, whatever. There are moments that it's just like, we're not there. And it starts with that acknowledgement of, okay, I'm not where I should be. And then it starts with just that grit. That grit like David to say, you know what? I'm gonna get my head in the game because God gives, saves, heals, rescues, delivers. I mean, what hasn't he done for us? So I'm going to choose today to praise the Lord.